Hello, and welcome to the Fiber Circus. This is episode 17. It's March 20th, 2019, and I'm your host, Elizabeth, coming to you from southern Indiana, where I run my hand dyeing, knitting, spinning, machine knitting, and farm critter raising um, business known as the Spotted Circus. If you need to get a hold of me, you can contact me on Ravelry, Facebook, and Instagram as Spotted Circus, or the rest of my contact details are below just underneath in the show notes. So if you haven't already subscribed to the podcast, please hit subscribe and like. And if you're a returning viewer, thank you very much for coming back. And if you're a new viewer, hopefully you enjoy the fun. So I've done a lot of traveling the last week and a half to two weeks. So I don't have quite as much knitting as what I thought I would. Um, but I do have a bit of spinning, a whole ton of machine knitting. And then I've decided in the middle of all that to cast on a new project because, you know, that's what you do, of course. So, going on to works in progress. Um, I mainly worked on two things while I was gone the last couple of weeks. Because of the fact that I knew I was going to be traveling, I wanted something that I could work on somewhat mindlessly. And that was at a point where I could work on it and not have to concentrate too hard. So, I did work quite a bit on my Seriously Holy by Stephen West. And if I can get it untangled here, I can show you. So, it's still growing quite a bit. Um, last time I recorded, I was down there. So I did put quite a few rows on it. I think I'm just about to the point where I'm going to start putting in another round of these big eyelets on it. So the yarn that I'm using is, this white yarn is a brushed alpaca with silk. And it's in the rainbow spray or Neon Sprinkles colorway. And then my black is on my Packaboo base, which is an Alpaca Merino Bamboo Nylon, and it's in the Disco Lights colorway. I'm knitting it on the recommended needle size, and I'm using Addy Clicks. The problem is, is that the numbers have worn off of them because I've used them so much. So I'm doing pretty good on it, I think. In theory, I wanted to have this done for show season, so that way I could have it as a booth display thing. Um, but that's probably not going to happen because there's still quite a good sized chunk of this left to go. But I do have more of this yarn base coming in, hopefully later on today. So I'll be dyeing it up and I will have these skeins ready for sale for the fiber event that's coming up next month. So if you're interested in doing a seriously holy like I am, you'll totally be able to order them. This is my first brioche project. And I have to say two color brioche is a lot easier than one color because it's pretty easy to see when you should be doing your knit stitches versus your purl stitches. And I do like the way it's turning out so far. I think it's pretty cute. So that's my first work in progress. And it's living as usual still in my squid bag from Star Knits. So I got a bit of work in on that. I didn't get as much work in on my sweater that I'm doing, mainly because I didn't think I could pay attention to the cables quite as easily as what I could the brioche, because the brioche was pretty mindless when I was working on it. So the sweater that I'm currently knitting is called Dangerfield Island by Tannis Gray, and I'll show you what it's going to end up looking like. So there's the sweater. It's got cables that run down the front and then a big cable panel in the back. And I am knitting it out of Paint Box Yarns Simply Chunky. And this is 100% acrylic. I wanted something that was cheap to knit and that I'd be able to wash pretty easily. So there's a hundred and... 149 yards per skein. And I want to say that the skeins were under 250 an out, or 250 a ball. So this whole sweater is going to maybe cost me... 25 to 30 dollars, which I really like that. So when we last left off, I was down here. So you can see I've done maybe about an inch or two on my sweater. And it is a reverse stockinette. So here's one of the front panels. And it's got this cable running all the way down it. And I've got my stitch markers to show me where the buttonholes are supposed to go. And then the back panel which is upside down right now, but you get the idea. It's a giant cable panel running all the length. So I've split for the sleeves right there, and I'm working my way down, and I've got 13 inches to do from the sleeves to the base. I'm only uh, three, 
I bet I'm probably four and a half to five inches in and it's becoming a bit of a slog for me for some reason. I guess it's because every single row with the cables I have to actually pay attention to that part and it's just not quite as motivating to work on as a result. Um, I am knitting this on size 10 and a half interchangeable zing needles. Um, it's helping to make the acrylic slide along really really well. So it's going okay. In theory I want to have this done by the end of April because I want to get points towards prizes for SSK that I'm attending in July. But I have to have it done by the end of April. So I've got a good sized chunk to go. It may end up being short sleeved as a result so that way I can say I finished it at least. But it's making some progress. Just not quite as quick as what I would like to see it moving, especially since it's a bulky weight. Um, and it's living in my Bags by Awesome Granny Firefly Kids bag, which, you know, great size. It's holding the majority of my sweater, and there's room to spare, and it's got a great handle, which I really like. So those are my two works in progress that I had this week, and I decided to cast on something. So this cast on happened because I was participated in the fiber share um, program and fiber share is where you sign up and you get matched with somebody and you both agree to send at least 200 grams of yarn or two skeins and then you can go up above and beyond from there as far as extras and interesting things that pertain to that person. You have to fill out a questionnaire so that way you can kind of give your partner an idea as to what you like and what you don't like. So my fiber share partner came from a yarn store actually out in New Jersey, which was kind of cool. And she sent two skeins of hedgehog yarns and then one, what's the other one? And a third skein and then some other little random things. But one of the things in my fiber share box was this awesome pom-pom. It's been kind of beat up because it's riding around in my in my thing in my bag but look at this pom-pom I mean it's neon pink and orange and yellow and when I got to looking into it it's actually raccoon fur which I would have never have guessed that that was raccoon fur but it makes kind of sense I mean this is the long outer coat of the raccoon and down inside it's really soft and then it has a detachable snap that I'll be able to sew in and when I got that pom-pom I was like oh my god I need to cast something on immediately and she'd included a pattern by Andrea Mowry for one of her uh, very basic brioche hats and a skein of hedgehog that was black and a skein of hedgehog that was neon green and whitish. And the more that I got to looking at it, the more I thought, this really needs more color in it. So I pulled out two skeins from my stash. And one of the skeins is from Dye Candy, which is out of the UK. And it's in her super sock called Dark Magic. And then the other one is from Ba Yarns, and it's their La Jola base, and it's called Sealed with a Kiss. And that Sealed with a Kiss actually came as part of my last fiber share that I did. So I decided to cast on the Vintage Prim by Andrea Mowry, and I really liked it because I thought it would really show off the two colors well, but it would still be brioche. And it actually doesn't require a lot of yardage, I discovered. So I cast it on with size US 3 knitting needles. I think it called for fours, but threes are whatever included in my fiber share thing, and that's what I had convenient, so that's what I used. So here's the hat. And I've just started the decreases in brioche in this section. And you can see I have a brioche rim going on. And then the sides are in garter stitch, which I don't really like the look of the sides as well. The pink is popping out a bit much for what I was hoping for. But the bright pink is the ball yarns, and then the dark is the dye candy yarns. And I think that once it gets done with this slightly crazy pom pom on it, I think it'll look pretty awesome. Um, so I'm cruising along on it. I've got one repeat out of, I think it's three or four done. I think it's going to fit. I mean, it seems like it's going to. That's for, after reading the, uh, project notes from a couple of different people. Some of them had said that it was a little bit too big and too loose. So I guess going down a needle size probably won't hurt, 
but I love how brioche looks like this on one side and then that on the other side. So it's technically reversible. So that being said, yeah, that's really, really bright. I have a feeling this is going to be the outside mainly because I like the way that the black looks. So I'm working on that right now and carrying around my little raccoon pom-pom with me everywhere I go. The kitten eyeballed it once and that was enough to make me realize I really need to stick it up someplace farther. So it's just a fun pom-pom. really like it. And it obviously was motivating to, for me to cast on something with it. So that is living completely out of season in a fat squirrel Halloween bag because, you know, why not? I like Halloween. It's got a nice handle on it that I can attach things to. So that was what I worked on a lot during the show that I was working at this past weekend because I was working on the brioche ribbing and it was pretty mindless. And I say that, but when I got home I realized I had about six stitches where I'd done the wrong stitch pattern in it. So I had to watch a few YouTube videos to then figure out how to fix brioche easily because just dropping down and trying to knit back up didn't really seem to work for me very well. So I found a way to do it with a crochet hook. So I went through and fixed some brioche and it wasn't that bad. Had it been in the increases and decreases, I wouldn't have done it because that would have been too much for my mind to handle, I think. So that was my newest cash on for this week. In finished objects, I don't have any hand knitting finished objects, but I did have a bunch of machine knitting finished objects. I decided that I really needed to kick into gear with making products to sell at this um, event that I was at. So I knit a whole ton of cowls um, and hats, and I already showed the baby blanket last week. And I sold quite a few of them at the festival, not as many as I had thought, and it was mainly because the buyers really didn't understand the amount of work that goes into a handmade item. I had a gentleman look at my portage sweater that I'd hand knit out of yarn that I'd dyed. And he's like, oh, I want to buy that sweater. It's Mardi Gras colors. And I'm like, okay. And he's like, well, how much is it? And I sat there thinking and I said, well, you know, there's six skeins of my Polworth DK in it. So that's $150-ish worth of yarn. And it took me a little over two months to hand knit it. So going by that, even if I just doubled what I had charged for the yarn, I'm still looking at at least 300 So that's $150, or no, that'd be $75 a month to knit on, and I didn't think that seemed quite enough. So I threw out the number 450 and he's like, wow. And I'm like, well, you know, it two months worth of work went into this. It's not like this was Walmart where it was just whipped out in an afternoon. You know, and I also hand-dyed the yarn that went into it. So this is a completely handmade garment. And he understood after that. I also had somebody that wanted to purchase my shift cowl that I'd done because she didn't knit, but she really liked the look of it. And that was another one where I was like, you know, there's five skeins of yarn that are $20 a piece retail. So we've got $100 worth of yarn into it. I said, you know, it's going to be at least $250 for that cowl because I had to knit that cowl by hand. And that kind of stopped her as well. So I'm starting to think that maybe I need to make a graphic that shows why knitting is so expensive, like hand knit, hand done goods. I had a lot of questions from people that I was doing demonstrations showing drum carding and then spinning and then working on my knitting machine. And people were like, wow, so you first you dye the hair. I'm like the, the fiber, yes. And then you card it, and then you spin it, and then you have to knit it afterwards. And I'd tell him, and then you also have to feed the animal that that came from. And I said, and that's why hand-knitted goods are so expensive. There's a lot of handwork that goes into it. And that's also why you only had one pair of underwear back in the olden days, because if you had to do it all by hand, you didn't have a whole lot of outfits. So eventually I want to make a graphic that illustrates the process of going from animal to finished good, just to try to impress upon people the amount of work that it takes to actually knit something by hand um, versus being made in a factory. So it was interesting to say the least. So I did quite a few machine knit things and I'll try to put a picture up here of some of the stuff that I did. So while I was demoing, I also worked on some spinning while I was there. 
I finally finished all of the fiber from the uh, frost yarn bats that I was working on. So this is a 16 ounce bobbin and there's somewhere between 14 and 15 ounces of singles on here. I don't really know what I'm going to do with them yet. I can't decide if I'm going to try to chain ply them back on each other to maintain the color changes or if I'm going to ply them end to end to make a two ply or if I want to spin up another set of bats and then ply those together to make kind of a mishmash of stuff. I'm not real sure to be honest. And the last end of this bat had an awful lot of fire star in it. So there's tons of sparkles, there's some silk noil going on. And I have a feeling that the thickness that I was spinning here is not quite the same the farther it goes into the bobbin. So for right now it's just going to kind of sit and hang out because I'm not real sure what I'm going to do about it. So once I got through that pretty quickly, I figured I needed something new to start demoing on. So I pulled out a braid of my Merino blend fiber called Clown Wig. And it's one of those where people always look at it and they think, wow, that's obnoxious because it's got very bright colors that are all blended together and people can't envision at all what it's going to end up spinning like. So I did a really quick spin. It's I would say it's probably a worsted to bulky weight and there's 82 yards for four ounces so it's definitely not a ton of yardage but I was attempting to just spin somewhat rapidly and to maintain the colors in a very bright rainbow. So I did a real simple two ply and this is how it spins up. It actually spins up as a really pretty like almost a jewel tone orchardy looking kind of thing. And I've found that the thicker I spin it, the more that I can really maintain those bright colors. So I was pretty happy with it. Not real sure what I'm going to do with this kind of yardage. I haven't set the yarn yet. It's pretty energized because I was talking and spinning at the same time. So it's got a nice loft though. It's nice and squishy. So it's a pretty yarn. I'll set it, see what happens with it. And it may just end up going up for sale on the booth. You know, see if somebody else wants to give it a good home. It'd make a good hat, probably. And I bet that I could probably do a pair of wristers out of it, too, if I tried. So that's all the spinning that I did for this past weekend. Um, acquisitions, I did really good. I didn't really buy much of anything because I was vending the whole time and I didn't really have time to go around and talk to other vendors. However, I did buy some yarn because I'm going to be running out of the Packaboo that I use on my machine currently. So I've been looking for another alpaca base to run through the machine to see how the machine likes it. So I went down and talked with my friend Stacy at the Imperial Yarn Company and she's based out of Oregon and they had a new sock yarn and it's a 60% alpaca, 30% superwash merino and 10% nylon in a fingering weight. You get 190 yards per 50 grams and it's sold currently in 50 gram skeins so to make socks you need two of them. This was a hand dyed yarn that they're calling Carnival Burst and then I got two skeins of white. So I'm probably going to dye the white maybe a deep rich blue and then make an alpaca hat out of it. Um, I knew that I'd need close to 400 yards to do a hat which is why I had to buy two of these uh, white ones. So it's a pretty nice yarn so far. I like the way it feels. It is a three ply and it's got a nice tight twist on it and a nice shine from the alpaca as you can see. So I'm going to run it through my machine and see how it works and see if I like the sensation or not. And if so, then that may be the new sock yarn that I carry for an alpaca sock yarn base. So definitely check out Stacy's yarn. This is the Imperial Stock yarn or the Imperial yarn from the Imperial Stock Ranch out in Oregon and they're all 100% American made and American grown and I was a part of sorting the fiber that probably went into this um, because I know that they buy their fiber through the Alpaca Coalition of America sort. So we'll see how that goes. I'm going to try to get it dyed this week um, and then I will let you know next week hopefully how it goes. So travel-wise, this past week I was out in Denver, Colorado at the Alpaca Owners Association National Show. It was in the middle of the bomb cyclone that happened out there, 
We left Tuesday, early Tuesday morning and drove from Indiana. I picked up some friends in Illinois and we drove all the way out and got within an hour of Denver Tuesday night because we knew that the storm was supposed to start and turn over to snow on Wednesday morning. So we left in time to get into Denver right as the snow started and we pulled into the complex and actually did all of our unloading and that's when the snow really hit. So we went, the drive out was not fun. It was extremely windy the entire way and with the trailer attached I was getting around nine and a half miles per gallon which was very very painful because it's like an 1100 mile trip out there. So it felt like I was filling up with gas every five minutes. And if you've ever driven across Missouri through Kansas and up into Colorado, there aren't many places to stop at for gas. So you really have to watch yourself as you're driving. So we got in, we got unloaded, excuse me. And while we were unloading, we kept kind of eyeballing the weather and saying, you know, we could head back to the hotel, which is just nine miles down the road, or we could continue setting up. And at that point, the snow was swirling everywhere. It was hard to see, so we kind of waited. And we waited till around three o'clock to go back to the hotel. And it's a good thing that we went when we did, because it took something like 25 minutes to go the nine miles on the interstate back to the hotel, because there were whiteout conditions where you could barely see. Um, shortly after that, they actually closed the interstate coming into Colorado about two miles past our exit where the hotel was. So thank God we made it in. Um, as a result, though, uh, most of the alpaca owners were coming in on Thursday morning to set up. And the interstate coming across on 70 from Kansas was closed. The interstate coming down from Wyoming and Nebraska was closed. And the interstate coming over the mountains from the west was closed. So there was a bit of an issue with getting people to the fair or to the actual facility grounds there. And as a result, the show got pushed back with a start time that became later on on Friday versus Friday morning as it normally is. But as far as I know, majority of the people ended up making it in. You know, they just had to sit there at the state line and wait for the for Colorado to take care of opening up the highways. Um, it was interesting to see. There was... I want to say five or six inches of snow in the parking lot the next morning and when we went to go get the van to go out to the facility I was stuck in the parking lot I have a rear wheel drive van there wasn't a ton of weight in it and for an embassy suites they hadn't cleared the parking lot at all which you know it's an embassy suites I kind of think of those as being top of the line somewhat but yet they didn't manage to clean the parking lot which was kind of weird so we had to push me out to begin with out of the parking space and then I had to get a push to go up the slight hill to get out onto the road so that was awesome uh, by the time we left on Sunday the majority of the snow had melted so you know it was a quick one and done big storm like that um, everything closed when that storm happened we'd con been considering getting food on the way back and all the restaurants were closed and you know it's bad when the pot shop that's across the road from the hotel closes too. I mean, even the House of Dankness was closed down for the day. So, you know, it's a pretty big deal when the pot shops close. So I did a lot of vending there. So thanks a lot for everyone who stopped by to check out all the interesting things that I had there and to talk to me about fleece and about machine knitting. Um, great group of people that came by and a lot of crowds really. So that was pretty awesome. Didn't get to watch a ton of the show because the way that the facility was laid out, I was kind of isolated off in an area and couldn't see much of it, which I kind of sucked. I do like to see critters and stuff, but I did wander through the barn once or twice and I saw some beautiful harlequins that they're juvenile animals right now, but in two years I'm planning on a date with one of them with measles and in hopes to get even more spots. So it was pretty fun to see people that I hadn't really met, but I'd been Facebook friends with for quite a while. So that was my adventures and at the end of the podcast I'll put some video of the crazy ridiculous snow and just some of the stuff that I saw out around the festival. So besides that, upcoming travel. So March 30th I have a one day machine knitting class at Blooming Labs in Bloomington, Indiana. The class is currently full so if you didn't sign up early you aren't going to get in now because there's a limit to the number of machines that I have. On April 6th I'm planning on doing our shearing here at the farm. It's not exactly an open to the public event because I don't have time to explain what's going on when I'm trying to get the animals shorn because I myself do the shearing there. So as long as it doesn't rain, my plan is to shear on the 6th 
Um, if you are local and you'd like to help out and volunteer, get a hold of me. I'm always up for volunteers. You know, we always need somebody to help sweep the mat afterwards or help go get animals or write down weights, that kind of stuff. So that's coming up. Then April 13th, I'm shearing, helping out with a shearing over in Kentucky at Eagle Bend Alpacas. Um, Linda has a yarn store there called the Eagle Bend Yarn Shop, I want to say. Uh, but she raises Cormo sheep and alpacas and has tons of beautiful local farm yarns. And I work her shearing, helping her to sort her fleeces and get them into production. After that, we have April 19th and 20th is the fiber event in Greencastle, Indiana. And it's a two-day fiber festival. There's lots of great classes there. Uh, Kate Larson is teaching, who is the editor of Spinoff. So if you are somewhat localish, it's one of the first fiber festivals of the season. And I will be there vending somewhere. Don't know where yet. Supposedly it's only going to be a 10 by 10 booth. And in reality, I like 10 by 20 booths. So we'll see how much I can squeeze into a small space there. So after that, April 26th through 28th, I'm going to be at the Ma Paca Alpaca Show, which is in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania at the Farm Show Complex. And I'll be doing demonstrations and mini classes and vending there for those three days. So stop out and say hi. After that, we go... May 13th through 20th, and I'll be out in Colorado helping with shearing on a very large alpaca farm. Um, and I do their sorting for their fleeces there and help them to manage their fleece clip. So that's always a good time for me. And then June 7th and 9th, I'll be back in Colorado again for Estes Park Wool Market. I am teaching core spinning there on, let me think, I think it's Friday morning, Friday morning or Thursday afternoon, I think. But I'll be vending there. And Estes Park's a beautiful place if you've never been. Um, it's right at the foothills of... Shoot. What national park is that? Um... Well, it's right at the foot of a very famous national park that I can't remember off the top of my head. But when you go up to the top of it, there's snow still. And there's elk and all sorts of animals around. So, very pretty. Hotels are not cheap. Book now if you're interested in going. June 22nd and 23rd, I'll be doing the Fibery Fun Weekend at Rolling Oaks Alpaca Ranch down in Macanda, Illinois. And we're going to go from selecting raw fleeces for processing through to dyeing, washing, drum carting, and blending those fleeces in a two-day class. So really good way to get your feet wet with fleece. The 29th and 30th, I'll be doing a machine knitting class at River Hill Ranch down in Kentucky. They are just south of Lexington and Richmond, I think it is. So that should be a pretty good class. Then July 17th through 21st, I'm attending the Super Summer Knit Together in Nashville, Tennessee that's put on by the Knit Girls. That Saturday, I will be vending, and it is open to the public from 1 to 4 on Saturday with a small donation. Um, so there'll be a lot of great vendors there, so come and check it out. And at the exact same time, there's also the Natural Fiber Extravaganza in Nashville, Tennessee. And there will be classes and a vendor marketplace. The Alpaca uh, National Fleece Show will be there, um, along with a lot of workshops. And that Sunday, the 21st, I am teaching core spinning and dyeing natural colored alpacas with other colors. So basically over dyeing natural colored alpacas. So we're going to be taking... The majority of the natural colors that they do and then over dyeing it all with the exact same amount of fiber or of dye in like four or five different colors to see you know what happens when you dye fawn with purple you know or brown with purple or let's say silver gray or rose gray with purple so we're going to be doing that and you'll have samples to take home so it'll be a really good class and then past july so far i think the only thing is really saf which is the end of October out in Nashville, North Carolina. So quite a few things coming up in the next couple of weeks. I got a lot of dyeing to get done, um, some more machine knitting probably to do, and some website updating to do, which is always lots of fun. So that's the majority of what went on these last two weeks. It's been pretty chaotic. It was 2,300 miles, I think, total driving. So it's a haul to get out to Colorado and that was trip number two out of four so far this year. Oh, and now that I remember it, I have another event. Um, towards the end of August, I'm going to be judging Yak Fiber at Yakapalooza, which is going to be up in upstate New York. 
and I don't remember where exactly. I've got to look it up, but I was just asked to do that recently. So more yak judging fun come in August, so that'll be a good time. So I guess that's the majority of it for this week. So the next time we talk, I think it'll be right before shearing. So maybe I'll give you a little talk about how it is we do our shearing and what all it is we go through. And then I'll try to do some video of shearing when we do it. So that's about it for now. Hopefully you guys have a good week and we'll talk to you later on. Bye. Thank mm -hmm. you.